today I want to talk about something that I believe that everyone struggles with, and we're going to be talking through some fundamentals of our faith, and if you have your Bible, why don't you turn with me to Isaiah chapter 55, and while you're turning there, I know you just sat down, but we're going to read God's Word today, and you know what I'm going to ask you to do, so if you already know what to do, why don't you go ahead and do it, and that is to stand in honor of God's Word today. Isaiah 55, we're going to begin in verse 7 today. I'm reading out of the NIV translation. It says this, Let the wicked forsake their ways, and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on them, and to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed to the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty. It will not return to me empty. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve, the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out in joy. How many of you need some joy this morning? It says that you will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the juniper and instead of the briars, the myrtle will grow. God is saying there's going to be an uprooting that's going to take place. He's gonna change some things. It says this will be for the Lord's renown for an everlasting sign that will endure forever. I think we could just go home just by reading that. But I want to preach to you today from the subject, keep your head in the clouds. Keep your head in the clouds. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for what you've already done in our life. We pray, Lord, that you would bless this time together. Bless our minds. Bless our hearts. Speak to us, Jesus. Refresh us from the inside out. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said? Amen. You may be seated. Today I want to talk about how we think, because I have found that most of the battles you will face begin in your mind. And the truth is we all have belief systems and things that drive our life to where we are going, and how we think and what we think will determine most of the outcomes in our life. There's a famous Bible teacher, her name is Joyce Meyer, some of you may know who she is. She says this famous quote, which I believe is very profound and very simple in the same manner, and that is, we need to think about what we're thinking about. We need to think about what we're thinking about. Why don't don't you just touch the neighbor next to you and say, that's your problem. That's your problem. We need to think about what we're thinking about. Because in life we're taught and to believe in religion that there is a devil and he is our enemy, but I have found that in my own life, and although the devil is our enemy, I have found in my own life that my greatest enemy is in me. And it's in this text that deals with the subject of our thoughts. As a parent of a seven-year-old, a five-year-old, and a two-year-old, please pray for me, but I am reminded daily of the power of an imagination. I'm reminded about the creative power of an imagination, but I'm also reminded about the destructive power of an imagination. All the parents said yes. I mean, just the other day, I walked in on my kids. This was not too long ago, and as I walked into their room, they had invented this booby trap. There was these forts all with, with, with sheets and chairs and they were hidden under their beds and they were getting ready to launch an attack on some mystical being from the, 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 the alien uh, planet of Wanahakalugi or something. I don't know, but they were ready to go. The power of an imagination. I walked in and I turned around and walked straight back out. <laughs> 
I didn't know what was about to happen. But I wanna make an announcement today that your imagination is under attack. Your mind is under attack. The enemy is after your imagination. Your imagination is the incubation place where every great thing that you will ever think will come from. For any opportunity that you will create or seize in your life, your imagination must be active and the enemy has set out to sabotage your imagination. He has even set out to imprison you even in your own imagination. Here's what I mean by that. Your mind is the place where all of the miracles that God will want to work in your life will begin. Your mind is also the place where a lot of the miracles that God wants to work in your life will die. It all happens in the mind. So the enemy will say whatever he has to say, make you believe whatever he can make you to believe to, 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 to not understand the purpose of God. And if you don't believe in the devil, you just need to have some kids. <laughs> but the enemy will try to create in your own imagination a sense where you can't stand to be alone in your own thoughts. You can't stand to be alone by yourself. That in other words, he wants to capture your imagination. He wants to sabotage. He wants to steal. He wants to take away. He wants to destroy your mind. As we study this passage in scripture today, the scripture that God says, it says that he will send his word, his word into your life for a purpose. And so the enemy, knowing that he is trying to do this, will try to plant thoughts in your mind that will pervert that purpose, to try to distort the purpose of God, and he wants to make you captive of your own imagination. So that way he can take away this sense of anticipation and turn it into anxiety. Have you ever thought about that? That the same organ that creates anticipation in your life also creates anxiety? That the same imagination that can really get you excited about going to see Justin Bieber in concert can also keep you up all night worrying about things that may not ever happen? The same organ. You've got to capture your imagination. You've got to make a decision in your life that my imagination is a gift from God and I'm not gonna let it turn into an IMAX screen to project whatever fear or whatever insecurity or whatever scenario that the devil is trying to broadcast in my mind. I'm not gonna let it happen. And I believe that today, somebody's going to get their mind back. That somebody's going to get their peace back. But if I'm gonna get my peace back, I've got to regain the territory in my mind. I've gotta take captive back my mind. And this scripture is important because the Hebrew people have been going through this cycle, and that's the first thing I wanna to mention today. If you're taking notes today, I want you to write down cycle. They've been going through this cycle. And for those that don't know, Isaiah is a, a prophetic book, and so Isaiah is writing this book in a particular chapter 200 years before the people would ever need it. They were carried away into captivity, which began a cycle. And they, they would begin to believe and think like the Babylonians instead of thinking like where they were from, and they began thinking as if they were trapped. And the reason that this applies to us today is because we may not be in physical captivity, but I believe that the worst things that you can ever face in your life is to be free physically, but be enslaved mentally. Yeah. To, be, to have the freedom, the worst thing in the world is to have the freedom to do something different with your life, but not have the psychological ability to break free from old memories. It's the worst thing in the world. Because if you let the enemy, he will manipulate your memories and chop them up together so much that you are afraid of your future and you can't even think about tomorrow without feeling something in the pit of your stomach. What's happening here? He's attacking your imagination. He wants to get you into this cycle. It's a, it's a vicious cycle. If you look at the negative thoughts in your life, typically they occur in cycles. They're set off when you're tired. They're set off 
when, when you're alone or you're lonely. They're set off in moments of your life when you are triggered by particular things that make you go into old ways. And yet as believers, often we are so much more focused on the symptoms than we are the cycle. We're more, fo more focused on the surface level of it than actually understanding where it comes from at its core. And so I want to tell you today, if you're just trying to pop pills to make your symptoms go away, if you're trying to slam back some drinks just to make your symptoms go away, if you're trying to just sleep with people to make your symptoms going away, and you never address the cycle that created those symptoms to begin with, you will not move forward. You will remain in that cycle. And God ends this passage talking about the symptoms. The symptoms. He said, instead of the thorn bush, it will grow a juniper. Instead of the, the, the briars, the myrtle will grow. And this is going to be a sign. But before you can see the sign, before the situation can be fixed, before the symptoms can go away, you've got to break the cycle. Why don't you tell your neighbor today, it's time to break the cycle. It's time to break the cycle. And we came to church today not just to make us feel good about our symptoms, but we came here today so that way the word of God could transform us and could break our cycles that have kept us trapped. In fact, I came as a liberator today to challenge you that whatever chain in your life is holding you into a cycle that has kept you trapped, for every cycle that's kept you stuck, for every cycle that's kept you unemployed, for every cycle that's kept you single, for every cycle that's kept you in terror, for every cycle that's kept you paralyzed in pain, God is saying today is the day to break the cycle. The cycle must be broken. The cycle must be broken, this, the cycle of pessimism. The cycle of a victim mentality. The cycle of a worldly view, it must be broken. Because if you don't break the cycle, you're just gonna go around and around. In this passage, God says in this passage, you will break the cycle when you turn to me. It says, let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Isn't, isn't God so smart? Isn't he so, how, how is it that God already knew what it took the neurosurgeons and the neurologists just about a decade or two ago to figure out in what he just said in this verse seven? He said, in verse seven, it's fascinating. He said that what, what they have to do is they, if they change their ways, they'll change their thoughts. How, how, how do how did he know that when they started studying their brains in our life that we would find out that when our neurons fire, they create these things called pathways, neural pathways in our brains showing us that over time if we continue to do the same things, it will get, create an automatic neuronic pathway. I don't even know if neuronic is a word, but I'd like to say things that maybe sound more photosynthesis, so it's okay. But, <laughs> but they would create these neuron pathways in your brain showing us the way that we are right now and it is a byproduct of our life of what we've thought up until now. That the thoughts we've had, the way we've lived our life is based off of the thoughts we've had up until now. And scientists, they think they're so smart. They think they're so much smarter than God. When God said this in about 800 BC, he told us that if we, wanna, if we think a certain way, you can live a certain way. If you think a certain way, you can be a certain way. Well, that's just the way I am, no. That's just the way that you think. If you change the way you think, you'll change the way you are. If you change the way you are, you'll change the life you have. But it starts with a thought, and a thought is like a seed. It's like a seed. So God uses this cycle that we can understand to help us understand our thinking, which a lot of us struggle to understand to begin with. And he uses this analogy through Isaiah of the cycle of the rain and seed and harvest. So rain falls on the seed to create the harvest, right? So the rain can only fall on seeds, but rain can only water a seed that's been planted. Are you catching this today? Rain can only water what's been planted. So I wanna ask you today, what seeds are you watering in your life? Because whatever you water will take over your garden. Whatever you water will grow. Whatever you irrigate in your imagination will grow. And it's an interesting word that he says in verse seven. 
Let the wicked forsake their ways. Now, forsake, that, that, that's a specific word. That, 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 is, that is a relational word. That's a word that means that we were close and you left me. That, that's a word that says that you were supposed to be with me. You see, somebody cannot forsake you if you're never close to them. Someone cannot forsake you if you didn't depend on them. So this word is a word that a child would use at a parent when they forsake them, when they left them. Why did you forsake me? It's a relational word. And could, be, could it be that God is addressing the fact that we have developed a certain relationship with our own thoughts? That although we say we want to break free of the cycle of negative thinking, we've actually become so comforted by that way of thinking that, that we wouldn't want God to break it because if, if it's what we've come to grow comfortable with, it's, it's something we become to depend on for companionship. That there can be cycles of thinking that become so ingrained in what we believe in the process in which we depend on them so much for the survival instincts that when God actually comes to try to challenge that cycle, you become resistant because you're so used to that old way of thinking. You've crawled in bed with it for too much, too long, that you'd rather be warm in the wrong thoughts than come out from under the covers of cuddling with something and finding a new way to think. But I say in the name of Jesus today, I declare that every cycle is broken because of the word of God. And God said that if you turn to me, even now, I will pardon you. He says, I want to recreate your mind. I want to transform your thinking. I want to help you transform what you think about it. I want to break your cycle. Why don't you shove the person next to you and say, break the cycle. Break the cycle. Just shove them. I'm trying to get you to wake up a little bit this morning. Break the cycle. Break it. It's time to break the cycle. It's time to break the cycle of self-pity. Now, before you clap and before you shout, okay, are you really sure that's what you want? Because... Make sure that's really what you want because some of you, you want the cycle of self-pity broken, but what would you do in disappointment when you, when you can't feel sorry for yourself? Are you sure that's what you want? I'm back. <laughs> that you can get so used to living on a certain level that when, actually, when God actually comes along to elevate you, you don't even want the promotion. I want to talk about that today. I want to talk about the level. If you're taking those, write that down. The level. The level that you think on. Isn't that what God means when he says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither your ways my ways? Let me, let me just, he says, this is basically what God says. Let me give you a picture. You know how high the heavens are above the earth? Yeah, that's how much higher I think than you think, says the Lord. That's how much higher my ways are than your ways. And for you to ex experience the peace and the purpose in your life, it's going to require another level of thought. Now, wouldn't it be cool, I got to thinking, wouldn't it be cool if there was a church with a name that was like suggested that where, wherever you are in your life today, that whatever your surroundings might look like, that no matter what situations you may be facing, that it doesn't have to stay like that for the rest of your life, that if you would just level up your thinking, if you would just press hard enough, if you would break through the clouds of your thought and your imagination, that there is something on the other side. You know, it'd just be cool if we had a church that had a name kind of like that. That if you came in person to church today, that I want to let you know that just from the name on the outside of the building and on the doors when you walked in, that you came into a place today for people that have said, I have decided that I want to have a sky break moment in my life, that I want to level up my thinking, that I want to grow from my situation, that I don't want to stay stuck in this cycle. And I want to break through the clouds and I want to see the goodness and the favor and the love of Jesus like I've never experienced in my life. What level are you thinking on? Are you, are you thinking on a, like you're a 13-year-old when you're 30? Still getting your feelings hurt over who didn't speak to you like you're a teenager when you were a grown person? Human being? I didn't say it. Tell your neighbor right now, just look at him dead in the eye. I'm telling you, I'm waking you up today. Tell your neighbor, look at him awkward. Just look at him in the eye. Real serious. Just look at him for just a second. And say this to them. Say, it's time to grow up. 
It's time to grow up. Paul tells us in the Corinthians, he says, he says, when I was a child, I what? I thought like a child. That was the level that I was on. But when I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. I forsake those ways. So let me just say it like this. If you want to level up, if you want to go up, then you're going to have to grow up. We came to church today. Let me say it another way. If you want to go higher, then guess what? It's always going to get harder. If you want to go higher in any element, any space in your life, it will get harder. Just like the Candy Crush game on your phone. As you go higher on the level, it gets harder. And just like every video game, every level has different opponents. And if you're going to go to the next level in your thinking, if you're going to go to the next level in your life, if you're going to go to the next level in your, your leadership and in your parenting as a spouse, as a manager or CEO, even as a believer and a follower of Jesus, you're going to have to face things that get harder as you go higher. There was one country preacher that said it like this, new levels, new devils. Some of y'all need to need a screenshot that on your phone right now, put it on your backdrop so you know. If I want to go higher, it's going to get harder. So as you think, you want to think on a higher lever, level and realize that it's going to require more of you to think higher. How many of you in this room are in a management position? You're in a man raise your hand. If you're in a management position in your job, like you manage people, this would go even to moms because you're managing like minor, like little terrorists around your house. Like if you're in management, raise your hand, management, raise it, raise it, raise it, raise it. I'm going to see how many people. Okay, I want, I want to talk, I want to say something about a management position, because this is, this is crucial, this is, this is specific. If you're in a management position, it's a little bit harder than just the simple employee position, because now you're not only having to manage your own discipline, your own thinking, your own decisions, but now when you got that promotion, along with that promotion came Karen. <laughs> and Karen is rude. And Karen likes to voice her opinion. And Karen doesn't always show up on time. And because you're a manager now, because you're required to think on a higher level, you're not only worrying about how you're gonna get to work with car problems, now you gotta think about how Karen is gonna get to work with car problems. And if Karen don't show up, who gonna show up? And so, let me ask you, are you sure you want the promotion? Because you're going to have to think on things differently in your mind. You're going to have to think on a higher level. The Bible says, Jesus said, we just read it. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. But he says, you do have the access to think like I think. And that God actually invites you to come up here and think on his level. You want to know how I know that? It says it in Paul. Paul was talking to the Colossians in Colossians 3 about, he's talking about the resurrection. He said that the resurrection is more than just the miracle. The resurrection is a miracle. It is a historical miracle that Jesus came out of that grave, but it's more than a miracle because Paul says in Colossians 3, since then you have been raised with Christ. Watch this. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Watch this. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. The resurrection is not just a miracle. The resurrection is also a mindset. And I came to ask you today, do you have a resurrection mindset? Can you look at something defeated and see deliverance? Can you look at obstacles and see opportunity? Can you look at shortage and see supply? Can you look at not enough and see more than enough? Can you look at conflict and see conquest? I'm talking about a resurrection mindset. I'm talking about the kind of mindset that knows that a seed didn't just go in the ground to die, but after it's done, it produces new life. Come on, somebody. We've got to think on a higher level. We've got to think on an elevated level. You've got to keep your head in the clouds. You've got to keep it in the clouds. How many of you are ready to go on a higher level? Like you're ready to enroll in the Heavenly Higher Education Program. Like you, you know what the goal of the Higher Education Program is, right? It's not, it's not just teaching what to think. It actually teaches you how to think, right? Right? Early on in, in the beginning of me in ministry and, and, and my leadership, 
I began to really t- just trying to figure things out and, and to grow, and I began to ask a lot of other leaders and pastors, like, what do you do about this? And, and what do you do about that? And what do you do when this happens? And, and one day it hit me. I'm asking the wrong question. Like, I'm asking a question, but I'm not asking the right question. And so I decided, I said, I, I need to elevate my thinking. I need to break this cycle of just trying to ask them what they're doing. And I realized that I can continue to ask them what they think, or I can elevate my thinking and ask how they think. There's a difference. That way I'll know what to do in my situation. And too many times we come to God asking him what to do. Instead, we should be asking him how to think about the situation. I need you to work on my mind. I don't need you just to tell me what to do. I need you to help me think about what I'm supposed to do. I need you to fix my mind. As a matter of fact, why don't you this week, I'm gonna give a challenge, don't ask God to fix a single situation in your, week, in your life this week. Instead, ask him to work on your thinking about your situation. Because you can control that. You can't control your situation. Even though you like to think that you control and you're a control freak and you think you can control your situation, don't nail a body in the room. But you gotta do what Colossians said, you gotta set your heart and your mind on things above. So why don't we make a promise today to set our minds not on earthly things, but to set our minds on things above, on, on heavenly things, on kingdom things. Not our opinions, not our beliefs on a subject, not our personal preferences on things, but that we will daily, each time a thought comes in our mind, to set our heart and our mind on his level, on the things of God. Jesus came that I may have life, and that life more abundantly, the abundant life, the extraordinary life, but in order for me to experience the life that God has given me, I'm going to have to come up to his level of thinking. And the only way I can come up to his level, the only way I can break the cycle in my life, the only way I can change my negative thinking is do it exactly what the scripture said to do, and that is turn to him. If I want to level up, if I want to break the cycle in my life, if I want to get out of this rut that I'm in, living in the same mindset, in the same issue, in the same situation, thinking about the same things, struggle after struggle, I can't fix it on my own. I'm going to have to turn to Jesus. And it says that he will give mercy and that he will freely pardon me. That, my friend, is the gift of grace and salvation. That's that's God extending to you the free gift of salvation in Jesus. And maybe for some of you today, maybe you're moved today. Maybe you've been stuck in this cycle And today, God has brought you into this place. He's allowed you to tune in from the other side of a screen. And today is your day to turn to him. Maybe you've been turning to other things. You've been turning to other people. But today is your day to say, you know what, God? I want to turn to you. That today is the day I want to place your life in my hands. And and I want to place it into the one who created it. I want to give it over my life to the one who knows this life through and through, who wants me to experience fulfillment, to hand it over to Jesus tell you, friend, the greatest decision you can ever make in your life, the greatest move you can ever make is the day that you decide to place your life in the hands of the Father. We think we're smart. We think we know this life, but we don't have a clue. Why not place your hands in the creator of it? Who knows you? Who knows you by name? Who knows every hair on your head? Who knows how he designed you and wired you? And today, if you're in this room today, with every eye closed and every head bowed in respect of one another, I want to give you an opportunity. Maybe you don't know Jesus today. Maybe you've never allowed him to to lead your life. And maybe today you've come in here and you're ready to break the cycle. You're ready to break that cycle of that poor mindset. You're ready to break the cycle of the level of thinking that you're on. And today you want to give Jesus the opportunity. He's knocking on the door of your heart. You just need to open the door. And today, you want to open that door to him. You want to allow him to lead your life. The Bible tells us that if we pray a prayer and we commit our life to Jesus, it says that we will be saved, that we will find this free gift of salvation in Jesus, that when we pass from this life, we can spend eternity in heaven with him. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, 
that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. It also says in Romans 10, 9, that if I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, it says I will be saved. Starts in your heart. You don't get yourself right. You don't get your life right to get Jesus. You get Jesus and he'll work out the rest. He'll take care of the rest. Well, I'm a drunk and I'm addicted and I got problems. Great. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. You thought these four walls were going to fall in the moment you stepped through this door, but guess what? We paid good engineers so they wouldn't, and let me tell you, you don't have to worry about that. You just come to Jesus, and he'll take care of the rest. So if you're here today and you want to make that decision, for Jesus to come into your life, I'm going to count to three. And when I say three, I, if you want to make that decision today to allow Jesus to lead it, I want you to raise your hand high. I just want to know who I'm praying with today. I'm not going to ask you to come to the front. I'm not going to ask you to, to, to point yourself out. None of that. I just want to know who I'm praying with today. I want to believe with you. And I want to pray this prayer with you. If that's you today, when I say three, I want you just to shoot up your hand. One, two, three. If that's you today, lift them up. Lift them up. I see that hand. I see that hand. Thank you, Jesus. Just lift them up. Lift them up. I see those hands. I see that hand. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I see that hand. Thank you, Jesus. I see it all the way up there. I see you. I see you. I see you all the way up there. I see both of you. I see you. Thank you, Jesus. I see you. Thank you, Jesus. You can put your hands down. I want us to pray this prayer together. Whether you're a believer or you're about to become one, I want us to pray where your ears can hear you. Say, dear Jesus, Come into my life. Help me to live a new life in you. God, I accept you as Lord and leader of my life. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on a cross for me. And today I ask that you would forgive me of all my sin and help me to live a new life in you. I put my faith in you. I put my hope in you. And I put my trust in you. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. And everyone shout a big amen. amen. Come on, why don't we celebrate church with every single person who accepted Jesus today. Somebody's breaking that cycle. Somebody's elevating their thinking. Come on, church, let's get excited about people who have turned their life over to Jesus. Amen.